Whenever we eat carbohydrates, such as some starch-filled bread, maybe a sucrose and glucose-rich strawberry, and we watch it down with some lactose-filled milk. That was a strange combination of flavors for the intro here. Our body has to take those carbohydrates and digest them or break them down into their smallest pieces so that we can then absorb them into the bloodstream so they can circulate and get to all of our cells who need the energy from the food that we eat. So in this video, we're gonna zoom into our intestinal villi. We're gonna take a look at the enzymes that break down those carbohydrates. And then we're really gonna focus on the process of absorption at the cellular level. How do we get those carbohydrates from our small intestine into our bloodstream so they can circulate. So let's jump to the whiteboard and get started. So we're gonna start with an intestinal villus. This is gonna be the little tiny folds on the lining of the small intestine. It's not the main folds you can see. The main folds you can see in the lining of the small intestine are the plaque circularis. These are gonna be small folds that are on those bigger folds within the lining of the small intestine. This is also gonna be where absorption is gonna occur, which is why we're gonna look at this first. The villus is mainly made of enterocytes, or these absorptive cells, that are going to absorb in these molecules, whether it's carbohydrates or lipids or proteins that we digest in our food. To further increase the surface area, enterocytes have microvilli on them. So this whole thing that we see here is a villus. Microvilli are the tiny little hair-like extensions that are coming out of those enterocytes. We have goblet cells. Goblet cells are gonna secrete mucus. It's gonna give a mucosal lining to our small intestine. There's gonna be a lot of digestion taking place in that mucosal lining. So here's our mucus layer, and then above that, we've got the lumen of the small intestine in this diagram. The lumen is just the space within the small intestine. Now running through this, we're gonna have arteries, and we're also gonna have veins. And we're gonna need those because remember, we're absorbing things into the bloodstream. So we need to be able to take those out of the small intestine via the arteries. And of course, we don't have diffusion in and out of the arteries and veins specifically. We have diffusion in and out of the capillaries. So each villus is gonna have a capillary network that extends up into the villus itself. We have one more thing here, which is gonna be a lacteal or a lymphatic vessel. And this is gonna be especially important for absorbing lipids or fats that we eat in our diet. So it won't be involved in this particular video, but it's important for lipid absorption. Now, of course, we don't just have one villus. We're gonna have many villi. So there's a second one in the diagram, but really there's gonna be millions of these villi that are all over the folds in the lining of our small intestine where we're doing all of the absorbing of nutrients. Now let's zoom way in on some of these enterocytes and the capillaries there to look at how this process of digestion absorption occurs. Now I'm gonna draw in the mucosal lining here. I don't know why I changed the color from purple to green for the mucosal layer. Too late to change it now, I guess. These are the microvilli that are extending out of the enterocytes and they're gonna form what we call the brush border, just like little hairs you know, on a brush. So let's start with our dietary carbohydrates, or the most common carbohydrates that we find in our diet. One of those that you saw when I was eating bread in the intro is starch. There's two main molecules in starch. There's amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is gonna be really a linear chain of glucose molecules but it's gonna form sort of a helix pattern. And amylopectin is gonna be more like what I have in this diagram here where we've got branches of glucose. Now in this picture, I've got six glucose molecules attached together, but really amylose and amylopectin, these starches are gonna have a lot more glucose molecules than that. It was just kind of a lot to draw out in the diagram. Now the problem with this starch is that we can't absorb it directly into our bloodstream. It's gonna to be too big of a molecule to get it through the enterocytes and then into our capillaries. So we'll have to break it down through digestion. Another common dietary carbohydrate is lactose. And lactose you see is made up of a galactose molecule bonded to a glucose molecule. And the other most common one that we're gonna see is sucrose. And sucrose is gonna be a combination of a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. So these are gonna be three of the main or most common dietary carbohydrates that we eat. This is not an exhaustive list. We also have cellulose or fiber, which we don't digest or break down. Actually, those make it all the way to our large intestine and then our gut bacteria are gonna eat those and break them down and use the energy from those. There's also a lot of just pure glucose or fructose and things like fruits. And there's these sort of middle level of oligosaccharides like maltodextrin and things like that. But these three are gonna be three of the most common and they give us a good kind of background of, of all the digestion that's gonna take place as we eat them. So let's start by breaking down that starch. We're gonna to have to break that down into something called maltose. And maltose is gonna be the third disaccharide. It's gonna be made up of two glucose molecules. So we're gonna take these big starch molecules and we're gonna start breaking them down into smaller bits, in this case, maltose right here. And we've gotta do that with some enzymes. So the main enzymes that we're gonna use, one is gonna be salivary amylase. As soon as I start eating the starch, with salivary amylase in my saliva is gonna start breaking down those starch molecules into maltose. The salivary amylase won't get the job done by itself. And the majority of that digestion though is gonna be taking place 
via the pancreas, the pancreas will release pancreatic amylase into the duodenum of the small intestine, where there's going to be a lot more breakdown of the starches that we've eaten. So at this point, everything that we've eaten now is going to be in a disaccharide form. We've got lactose, sucrose, and maltose, which are all disaccharides. But those are still too big. We need to get those down to the monosaccharide level, so we'll use some more enzymes for that. Before I get into that, I'm going to draw some more mucus layer right here to distinguish where some of these things are taking place. Everything in the white here is taking place before we get to the mucosal lining of our small intestine, and then everything in the green here is taking place in that small intestine where that mucus is right on the lining of our small intestine. So let's break down that maltose. We're gonna use maltase to break that down. And you'll see a naming convention here. Anything that ends in ACE is gonna be an enzyme that breaks down the molecule ending in OSE. So right, so maltase is the enzyme that breaks down maltose. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks down amylose or amylopectin. And that maltase is gonna be secreted primarily by our small intestine itself, the cells that are gonna be making up the villus. So the maltase breaks down the maltose into two glucose molecules. So now those are down in the monosaccharide form, ready to be absorbed in the next stage of the process. We're gonna use lactase to break down lactose. That's gonna leave us with a glucose molecule and a galactose molecule. And of course, if somebody's lactose intolerant, it means that they don't have enough lactase to break down all of the lactose that's in the diet. Everybody's a little bit lactose intolerant, like everybody has a limit to how much of this they can eat before they get sick, or drink, I guess, because it's mostly in milk. And finally, sucrose, which is found in a lot of fruits that we eat, as well as any added sugars, that's gonna be coming from sugar cane. So there's just a lot of, a lot of sucrose in our diet generally. Our body's gonna use an enzyme called sucrase to break down that sucrose into a glucose and a fructose molecule. Just a fun fact, of these three types of monosaccharides, galactose, glucose, and fructose, Fructose is by far the sweetest of the three. You can look up like sweetness scales online if you wanna know more about which of these various sugars are really sweet and which ones are less sweet. Just kind of interesting. Okay, so we have lots of monosaccharides, so now we're ready to do this absorption process. Before we do that, I wanna label a couple things on our enterocytes. First of all, we've got what we call the luminal or the apical membrane of the enterocyte. That's where we're gonna be bringing the molecules in to the enterocyte. And then we've got the basal membrane that's gonna be kind of the back or inside part of the enterocytes. And so we've gotta get them out of the enterocytes through the basal membrane so they can enter the capillary. All right, let's get these monosaccharides into our enterocytes. So let's start with fructose. Fructose is gonna enter in through a special transporter called GLUT5. GLUT5 stands for glucose transporter five, which I know what you're thinking. That's a super misleading name because this is gonna bring in fructose not glucose, but we still call it glucose transporter five. I don't know the history of, of the naming of all of these, so I'm not sure why that is. Why not call it fruit five or fruit one? And the five just means I think that this is probably the fifth one that was discovered um, by scientists. So fructose is gonna enter through glucose transporter five or glute five, and that's how it's gonna make it into the enterocyte. Now it's gonna do this through facilitated diffusion, meaning it has a special protein that it passes through, and it's a form of passive transport. So really these fructose molecules can escape back out potentially, but because there's gonna be a lot more fructose here in the lumen of the small intestine than there is in any given enterocyte, there's gonna be a net movement of fructose into the enterocytes. Next, let's take a look at galactose and glucose. These are both gonna use the same transporter actually, and that transporter is gonna be SGLT, or what we call secondary glucose transporter. It's using a form of active transport, but it doesn't actually use ATP, which is probably what you hopefully think of when you think of active transport. Using an ATP, you break it down to ADP and a phosphate, and through the process of that chemical reaction, we get some energy out that's gonna power the pump. But this is a secondary transporter, so it's not using ATP. It's gonna use a concentration gradient for sodium in order to power this pump. So that concentration gradient means there's gonna be a lot of sodium on the outside or in the lumen, of the small intestine, and there's gonna be a lot less sodium in the enterocyte. But how do we create that gradient? We have to create that gradient. We have to somehow get all of the sodium out of the enterocyte so that we've got a concentration gradient that's gonna power this transporter. So we've got a second pump that's involved in this, and that's gonna be the sodium potassium pump. What the sodium potassium pump is gonna do is it's gonna use ATP, and it's gonna use ATP to pump sodium out and then potassium into the enterocytes. So that's where our ATP is getting consumed. And so it's pumping out the sodium, it's pumping in the potassium. That creates the sodium concentration gradient, meaning there's very low sodium in here and very high sodium out here just because there's a lot of sodium in the things that we eat. So there's a lot of sodium in our small intestine. And then that concentration gradient of sodium coming in right here is gonna cause glucose and galactose to be actively transported 
into the enterocyte. And that's why we call this secondary active transport or this transporter right here, we call it the secondary glucose transporter is because we have a primary active transport pump here and this one is secondary or sort of reliant on that first pump that's using ATP. Great, so now we have fructose, galactose, and glucose all inside of the enterocyte. Glucose and galactose have been actively transported in. Fructose is passively transported in through facilitated diffusion. And now we've got to get those out of the enterocytes. And for that, we're going to use a protein transporter called glucose transporter 2 or GLUT2. Again, just because it's glucose transporter doesn't mean it just does glucose. And in fact, this one's not selective for the type of monosaccharide. It's going to let all the fructose come through, it's gonna let all the galactose come through, and it's gonna let all the glucose come through. So all three of those are gonna passively transport out of the enterocyte through the basal membrane, and all three of those are gonna pass into the capillary by sort of squeezing in through the gaps between the cells. Remember, capillaries are really leaky. They allow fluid to come in and out. They allow oxygen to come in and out and carbon dioxide. They're all about letting things in and out easily. So that's the process of taking these dietary carbohydrates that we eat in our diet, breaking them down into their monosaccharides, and then absorbing them into the capillaries so they can be in our bloodstream and then get transported from there throughout the whole body, wherever they need to go to nourish our cells. All right, let's do a recap of that. We're looking at three dietary carbohydrates. Starch first is gonna have to be broken down by salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase into maltose. The maltose is then gonna be broken down by maltase in the mucosal layer here of our small intestine into two glucose molecules. Lactose is gonna get broken down by lactase into a glucose and a galactose molecule. And sucrose is gonna get broken down by sucrase into a glucose and a fructose molecule. Now we've got all of these monosaccharides and we've got to get those into the enterocyte and then into the capillary. We're going to use several proteins to do that, a couple channels, a couple pumps. So fructose is going to get into the enterocyte by passively transporting through GLUT5. Then the sodium potassium pump, it's going to be pumping sodium out of the enterocyte, pumping potassium in. This is going to create a concentration gradient for sodium where we have very little sodium inside, lots of sodium outside. And so the sodium is going to pass into the enterocyte, powering the secondary glucose transporter, which is gonna bring in either a glucose molecule or a galactose molecule each time. So now that all three monosaccharides are in the enterocyte, they need to get out of the enterocyte through the basal membrane. They're all going to transport passively through GLUT2 or glucose transporter 2, and then from there they'll pass into the capillaries where they can go throughout the body. Now, if you've watched any of my videos, you know that the only way to learn this kind of stuff is to pause the video and practice it yourself and to study it on your own. So here's a blank diagram. Take a moment, pause the video, see if you can start with the beginning of this process and explain step-by-step step how these dietary carbohydrates are gonna make it into our bloodstream. Finally, special thanks to my patrons on Patreon who make a lot of this work possible. Thank you all so much for supporting. All of the diagrams for my videos, blank ones as well as completed ones, are available on that Patreon. So if that's something you'd find value in, consider checking out the Patreon. Also, if you're interested in learning more about all this stuff and learning especially how to do proteins, fats that we eat get into our bloodstream, and then to dive a little bit deeper into the villi and of our small intestine and how that all that absorption kind of occurs and get an overview of it, I've got a playlist here you can click on that'll take you to all of those videos. And uh, thanks for being here. I'll catch you all in the next one.